Good morning, and welcome to HR Examiner's Executive Conversations. I'm your host, John Sumser. Today we're going to be talking with an amazing fellow called Manish Gill, who is the founder and chief executive officer of something called Trustphere. Manish, how are you this morning? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'm afternoon for me, though. <laughs> Well, that'll teach you to live in a bad time zone. Um, um, would you take a moment and introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, so uh, my name is, hi everybody, my name is Manish Gohl. I'm the CEO and co-founder for Trustphere. Uh, Trustphere is a relation, is a specialist or a provider of uh, network analytics, but we're a pioneer in the area of relationship analytics. Got it. Um, so how'd you, how'd you end up doing this? I, I don't that as a, as a young boy, um, uh, <laughs> what you dreamed of was doing like this. So what's the story? Far from it, actually. As a, as a young boy, I, I thought I would be a doctor. That was kind of my, uh, that was the chosen profession. <laughs> but, but I got way late along the way and ended, ended up going to law school and, and business school and yada, yada. Ended up, uh, ended up consulting. So my, my career started with PwC Consulting. Uh, it was mainly strategic and operational consulting, but always in the emerging technology space. So um, I, for what it's worth, I grew up in, I was mentioning to you, I think, earlier, I grew up in Australia. So I always had a very global perspective on life. And from a global perspective, it meant like understanding, you know, what our global, what global clients were doing and in particular, uh, you know, how technology could be applied to, uh, you know, a number of the global clients that we were working with. So, I mean, just at my own end, a little bit of a, a little bit of background. I spent a lot of time uh, in strategic and operational consulting, a lot of change management, which became which becomes very relevant relevant within the uh, trust fair environment. But also a lot of M and A work, so post merger integration in particular. But yeah, so but what I had I had an opportunity, uh, you know, as I was go, as I was midway through uh, my time at PwC, they asked me to move from Australia, which is where I was, through to London and set up uh, an organization called PwC Venture Partners, where we were specifically looking at investing in technology companies, early, early stage emerging technology companies. So I ran that for a number of years. And uh, from PwC, left PwC, joined a company called, or set up an organization called Greenock Capital Partners, which is, invests again in data and data analytics companies. And Trustphere is one of, uh, one of the organizations that uh, we'd invested in, and I, I started as the interim CEO, and now I'm the CEO of Trustfair. So it's a kind of a long journey. Well, that, that is a long journey. So, so from Australia to London to uh, is your primary office New York or London these days? Yes. Yeah, so it's interesting. The company's headquartered in Singapore, but uh, the our our second office is in New York. So it's out of, it's out of the U.S. It's in New York, uh, but we do have offices in um, in the in uh, the U.K. And we have offices in Australia as well. It's, it's funny. My team always jokes with me because uh, I, one of the things that's really interesting, I end up traveling a lot. So I'm managing a team that's sort of spread across sort of seven time zones on four continents, which is uh, challenging to say the least. Um, but I end up doing around 300,000 miles a year. And one of my analysts kind of did, did some math on that. And they, 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 went, they, they went, Manish, do you realize that your resting speed is actually 35 miles per hour? I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, I, <laughs> that means you're actually over the speed limit. When you're sitting down, you're generally speaking over the city speed limit in most in most cities. <laughs> that's that's so. that's hysterical. That's hysterical. <laughs> so so let's let's dig in. Trustfear does. Trustfear Trustfear yeah. is a new kind of company, really. Uh, it is. What does what does the company do? Yeah, so it's a new kind of company dealing with what I would call something that's kind of old and old and old and well trodden. It's about relationships. So what what Trustfear does is it's an area that we call relationship analytics. What relationship analytics is about? Imagine you, you know the old saying is it's not what you know, it's who you know. We firmly believe it's not only what you know, but also who you know that matters. So if you think about the human capital equation, we think about um, everyone talks about IQ and EQ. We think it's IQ plus EQ plus RQ, and RQ being the relationship quotient of what exists. So people's networks are just as important as their as their skills and capabilities and the soft skills that they have. Uh, 
So what we're doing at Truster is we're using effectively what we call the digital exhaust for an organization. So think about email, voice, instant messaging. We're looking at the metadata only, so we don't we don't analyze content. We don't analyze um, uh, subject lines at all. We're just looking at the, the metadata. But what we're doing is understanding the networks that exist both within an organization, but also between an organization and their customers, suppliers, and partners. And we're using the intelligence and in we're using a set of uh, well, well-trodden network science, but do, being able to do this at scale to understand how an organization truly functions. Uh, we're, use, uh, we're, again, using those analytics as part of a variety of different initiatives which help organizations improve their effectiveness, if you will. Well, that's, that, that's an interesting premise, but you, you say that you don't look at content in the analysis, but it, it seems to be that, that the, so you've got, you got, I think, maybe four factors, EQ, RQ, and what you actually do as your job, right? And so, yes. so, so what you actually do as your job often trumps the rest of those things. We, without a doubt, Partic- without a doubt. But particularly I mean, I think- environments and so so yeah. so you make this map and it doesn't have any content to it how, how can you be sure that it actually reflects what's going on in the organization so actually it's interesting I mean the networks that exist in the organization let's, see, let's just go let's be a little philosophical and abstract for a moment networks exist all around us I mean if you look at the animal kingdom you look at you look at human society networks have existed all the way through in fact Part of the inspiration for what we're doing is uh, a professor called uh, a professor named uh, Robin Dunbar, and he there's a very famous number called the Dunbar number. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, he was an anthrop- he was a he was an, he's an anthropologist. For, for those listeners who, don't, who may not know him, fascinating research. But he's an anthropologist, and he specifically looked at communities and networks of communities. Um, and you know, he looked at, he looked across the board, and he recognized that the human neocortex can handle about 150 relationships at a time. In reality, his research showed it was between 100 and 240, uh, 240 something. The mean was 148. Uh, for convenience, everyone's rounded up to 150 as the Dunbar number. But in, in, in many ways, networks exist already. We intuitively, instinctively think about networks uh, whenever we do, when, you know, particularly in the corporate world, uh, whenever we're doing things. What's the problem we have so far is networks are, trying, are, are, are almost invisible. We know that they exist, being that they lie latent in an organization, but are never measured, never, never leveraged for a collectively for an organization, and never really well managed by individuals uh, for their, you know, for their for their own jobs. And I think going back to your point, depending on the job that someone has, uh, that you know, networks become increasing or increasingly or decreasingly important. It, it does vary. But if you think about a sales, if you think about sales and business development in particular. The networks are an incredibly important part of the success. It's okay, an important part of a success criteria for you know for for business, sales and business development people. And by the way, it's not just external networks there; it's internal and external networks. So, so, so this is this is interesting. There's a there's a flock of of companies who are moving in this direction, and um, all of them have to do with the creep have to deal with the creepy factor the, you know the the, <laughs> the the sense that that i'm being constantly monitored so the boss can understand me better is yeah. is one of the hardest dynamics in the workforce today i think no look I, I i totally agree with that by the way and i think that you know if not done correctly um, you know, the creepy factor can certainly can certainly um, prevent a lot of folks from actually getting the benefits from networks. We've taken that we take that very very seriously, and we we've taken an approach uh, which helps organizations, which we, we hope helps organizations understand and, and uh, get the value, helps individuals get the value from the data without ne- without the creepy factor. And I'll just explain a couple of factors that we. Uh, so a couple of elements that we uh, that we have in terms of our approach, which helps to address that. Um, the, f- the first one is we don't touch content. As I said, we do not do content analysis. Now, lots of people ask us, "Hey, would you like? We'd love to be able to analyze the content." I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we we can get a lot. We can get a very good understanding of the networks without un- without having to analyze content. Uh, to that extent, even in email and I- in instant messaging, we don't analyze the subject lines. So we're not interested in what people are talking about. What we're interested in is understanding the networks that exist for individuals. And I'll come back to that just in a second. The third thing is um, legal compliance is very important. 
uh, compliance with privacy legislation, and I think many of the listeners will be familiar with GDPR. We are fully GDPR compliant. For those of you who are a little geeky when it comes to understanding GDPR, the typically the primary primary uh, the, a sort of leg of GDPR that we use is Article 6.1.F, which is the legitimate interest article. I won't talk too much about that because I will bore you all to tears. I should have told you I studied law, uh, so I, I kind of get I get into this stuff a little bit too much. But certainly, we you know making sure and ensuring that we are legally compliant uh, is is a foundational element for us. And the last thing is just you know um, again this this is not so much from a creepy factor perspective, but we make sure that organisations they own the data that belongs to them. We're only mining data that ever that, that an organization has legal access to if they don't have legal access. So think of your domain. We're only ever looking at your corporate domain, never looking at sniffing or, sno- or snooping on someone's uh, email, on personal email. That's not of interest to us. In fact, we're not even touching people's LinkedIn accounts. What we are doing is looking at what's going through corporate mail servers only. And we're looking at just what's the minimum amount of data that we need to understand the relationship networks that exist. It's it's an interesting time to be alive, and and one of the one of the, the things I I imagine you must have to deal with is companies that handle network information have been pretty sleazy, um, and so a company claiming to to not touch bits and pieces of information that flows through them has this sort of Facebook open to it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> no, how do you reassure? How do you reassure people about this, right? Because yeah, you can say whatever you want. To, you know, these guys, these guys, in the Valley are great examples of the fact that you can say whatever you want to say without it affecting what you actually do. No, absolutely right. And, and you, you know, you're, you're you're absolutely right. I think you know it's a shame. I think that uh, certain organizations have sort of misused the trust that exists or they, that they have with their, with their uh, users. We'll leave that for a topic for another conversation. But the way that we do it is from a technological perspective, we don't ingest content. So there is, you know, right at the, right at the, you know, the reason we can give uh, very clear assurances uh, to our, our clients and, and their users that we don't uh, analyze content is because we don't see the content never touch the content because we don't even see the content there is not even a residual risk of us being able to analyze that content and again remember the purpose for us is understanding the networks and i want to make one distinction i mean the distinction that we're looking at is we're understanding the difference between connections and relationships and i use those words very deliberately and i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna ask you a question john you probably use linkedin sort of i do sort of yeah (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm sure a number of your listeners uh, use LinkedIn in any case. Um, but, you know, a question I have is uh, how many, you know, let's assume you had a thousand relationships on LinkedIn. How many of those do you think would be real? Uh, sorry, how many, if you had a thousand connections on LinkedIn, how many of those would be real relationships? It would be, it would be a fraction. And what we're sure. currently finding with our clients is a sm- very small number of those full, you know, the, of that full network, if you will, of those connections are, re- are true relationships. And the reason that's, that that's, uh, that's important here and it's an important distinction that we make is we're using network science to understand the, dif- uh, understand the distinction between what I call mere connections and real relationships, the most relevant relationships that exist. And that's the relationships are what bind an organization together. You think department by department. Uh, you, know, you think about uh, you know, group to group. Uh, there are a certain number of relationships, critical relationships that, are, that bind an, organi- an organization together and also an organization with its customers, suppliers, and partners. And being able to understand, if, you know, if you're in an organization, trying to understand or being able to very rapidly understand who in your organization has a relationship with someone in another organization and being able to do that systematically and at scale uh, is really what we've set out to do. So we're not, we're not in the business of, um, of you know, providing tools for management to sort of, uh, you know, uh, to, to, over, to, uh, to uh, watch over what employees are doing. It's more around enabling and empowering teams to do what they do better. And I, I, mean, I can talk a little bit about some of the, the ways our clients are using our technology, including, including areas like leadership and talent, uh, diversity and inclusion, and um, other ways of understanding collaboration and helping you know, in a post-merger integration environment. So, well, let's, we'll, get to that. we'll get to that in a second. I have, I have one mm-hmm. other sort of question about the business. It's to me that, that, that in any organization of substance, Networks are not like you, you, you know. It's it's easy to get the the sense that a network is something like utility poles 
in a city, right? And 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 you have wires between these poles, and you can see what's the important mm-hmm. pole by the number of wires. But what really happens in organizations is networks have modes, right? And and if you're solving the problem of it's the twenty fourth day of the third month in the quarter, and you're way behind on your numbers, there's a different modality of the network than there is if it is the um, um, beginning Perfect. of the five-year yeah. research project. No, very true. Absolutely. Right. Right. And so, how do you, how do you how do you see those differences? So it's, it's actually in the application. So if you think about the science behind the networks and understanding the network, uh, the networks are the networks that they uh, that, that exist. It, you're absolutely right. I think around the inter, in, in terms of the application of the science or of the, of the network scores, if you will, into different applications. Because, you know, depending on where you are in terms of in terms of either the business process or the time that you're, you know, at the time of the, time of the year or uh, time of the quarter that you're uh, in, you'll have a different set of business problems or business challenges you'll be solving. Some are going to be operational, uh, some are going to be strategic, some are going to be tactical. Uh, what we're saying is, uh, the, you know, and I mentioned earlier on that the RQ component of what we see, the relationship, quo- uh, relationship quotient component of what we have, that becomes incredibly powerful to understand at, for any one of those three, whether it's strategic, operational, or tactical uh, solutions, whether, you know, uh, we, uh, this becomes additive. And one of the things that we're able to do is, uh, in, in, and our clients are using us in these environments, really to help. Um, be unbiased, if you will, so to remove levels of bias, because everyone kind of knows people are connected or who the most important person in an organization is, potentially. But what we're able to bring is data to that, uh, to that particular equation, or at least from uh, bring a lens, a network lens to it to add to IQ and EQ and other elements around performance, for example. Got it. So now you've got this. Let's let's say there's a thousand people in the organization, and I'd imagine that's a smallish customer. You've sure. got yeah. uh, some um, complex mapping of the network of the relationships between all those thousand people. How do you make that so that I can understand it without getting a headache? Mm. <laughs> it's a great question. So the visuals that we have are beautiful, but they're not what we use. What we're doing effectively is understanding scores, and it's understanding the scores of those relationships and understanding for individuals uh, the number of strong relationships and number of strong active, rela- strong active relationships that they maintain at any one point in time. I must say one thing, because a lot of people ask me this, is it more is better? The answer is no. It's not necessarily that you have more. More is not necessarily better. More is just more. What we're doing is understanding the number of uh, strong relationships that, uh, that anybody has based on our uh, observing the behaviors of communication patterns. And I, I want to go into that just a little because I think it'll help, um, it'll help uh, you know, your listeners understand a little bit about how we operate. So the mm. difference between a connection and a relationship uh, is we, we use, thing, we use our, uh, something that we call a trust score. And it's an algorithm which looks at things like, how long have I known you? How frequently do we correspond? Do you write to me when I write to you? How quickly do you respond? Are you in the two, the CC, the BCC field? Where we can get calendar data, we use calendar data to infer that we have a stronger, a stronger relationship because we've met. Are we exchanging? Are we exchanging? Um, are we collaborating and exchanging content without looking at the content? We can start to see whether people are at, you know, whether it, we, we, what we're distinguishing between is a mere connection where we've had maybe a one-off, a one-off email once. Uh, once or twice versus where we're actually collaborating on a persistent basis because that starts to show you where the relevant networks are. And again, coming back to, to your question around how do people use this, it, it's, it's around scores. And I want to give you just one quick example. A simple, the simplest example for us is if you're running change programs. Clients of ours run change programs, and change programs typically have about a 70% uh, failure rate. The question is why it's often to do with the people. So it's about the selection of the people that you put onto that change program. What we're able to do is identify who the influencers are. And we've, I, I use influencers, uh, uh, sort of, uh, candid, I use it, use it just, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in a, I'm using it with uh, quotation marks around it. We, we identify who the influencers are in an organization based on, uh, based on understanding the networks that they hold. And most, if you look at most change programs, they often say, look, you know, we, can, we, we would normally put the GM or the SVP or the senior directors um, onto, the, onto the change management team. 
frankly, where, where the, the people who have most influence, particularly at the lower levels, are your N minus threes, N minus fours, N minus fives. In a large organization, who do you identify who you potentially want to put onto those teams? Networks give you the ability at scale to understand the candidates you want to bring onto those change teams. And it's not about visuals, and it, to, to make sure we don't give you a headache, the way we do it is just provide a list of people who are, your top, who are the top influencers based on the networks that they hold. That's interesting. So, so, so let me let me dig a little bit further. My experience in in big organizations, which is long, um, is that there are people around the organization who are strategically placed, often by by well intentioned management people who function as bottlenecks, um, mm-hmm. and 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 they're like gates on resources, and yep. and they are short staffed. Um, and narrow um, because they gate resources whether or not there's relevance to the project at hand. And so, mm-hmm. so these people do not have complex, fired-up networks. In fact, they are largely disliked and people largely avoid them because their job is to say no all the time. But their <laughs> node in, in the network um, is critical, even though it's not relationship based it's not you, i wouldn't encounter this person every day of the week and collaborate with them i would encounter them only when i absolutely had to <laughs> and, and, well, and, this, and so how does that show up in the in the network analysis because that's that's critical yeah. it's like the capacitor is the charge and everything goes in but nothing comes out until there's a certain I, trigger so that, I mean, that's a great question. And you know what? We can start to see that. So we can see who are the real brokers in the organization and who are the real bottlenecks. And with the bottlenecks, the way it often shows up, and this is where the visuals can help, you start to see um, alternate routes around that particular bottleneck starting to, uh, starting to, uh, to emerge, uh, where relationships kind of start to bypass a particular person. So the, you can start, the patterns start to emerge where you can see from you know, an, an individual's communication behaviors start to give um, a number of clues as to sort of, uh, you know, call it almost personality in some ways. And you can see whether they are very open and they are collaborating with larger groups of people or they are having one-off transactional, com- not, not conversations, but one-off transactional, intera- transactional interactions with uh, a small group of people. So, or even a large group of people, but you can see that the relationship, when, when you have a bottleneck, often enough you don't have relationship strength that grows from that. But where you have collaboration, you can see that relationship strength, uh, you know, the relevant relationships grow uh, significantly more. So, you know, it, it, you can start to see this in the patterns of uh, the, you know, the scores that we put out. Because, we're lo- again, we're looking at breadth, depth, and recency of, uh, of an active levels of currency, if you will, of those relationship networks. So do you have a do you have an implicit model of what a healthy uh, network looks like and and do you co- do consulting around making networks healthier meaning network function as health rather yeah. than some some wellness thing but but do do you have a model and and do you help people achieve I don't know greater throughput in the network or something like that Yeah no it's a great question so we uh, so the if answer to the first question is I don't think there is any ideal model. I think it depends role to role, country to country, and and um, and job function. You know, well, job function to job function, uh, country, uh, you know, country to country, as well as um, industry to industry. So I think there are there. It's it's not there's no not a one size fits all, uh, which is this is good and this is bad. What we typically do is we look at cohorts. So you can start if you have a thousand people in your t- you know in a particular group. Now, if you're baselining, an appropriate baseline would be what's the mean. Of the of the networks, or what are the mean of the scores for those that particular group? Uh, so you know, because we have it, those who are performing a fairly similar job function, should theoretically they they become um, much more easily comparable. Uh, we then, generally speaking, our clients are overlaying performance data again on top of that, um, or other or other uh, you know attributes to understand um, you know what is the right for that particular group, what is the appropriate. Uh, you know, relationship or a good relationship, uh, you know, uh, profile. And you know, for example, we're working with a client where we're looking at sales performance and network capabilities, both internal and external. Being able to correlate performance to an optimal uh, network size is actually an important baseline for then uh, for the for that organisation to then start coaching towards an ideal profile. 
coming back to it from a consulting side, we work with consulting partners. So we do have our own. We have a small consulting team. Uh, having come from a consulting environment, that is not my uh, my strategy at all. Um, we're working with some really smart consulting organizations around the world. Some large, um, and, you know, some household names that you would you would know um, amongst the big four, but also a number of smaller boutique consulting firms who specifically focus on things like leadership. They focus on diversity and inclusion, and they do uh, work around post-merger integration. Well, let's see if we can squeeze in one of those. Tell me about how you can apply this to diversity and inclusion. That's a really good question. I mean, <clears throat> I think the problem with I mean, I'm going to I'm going to start with a with a pithy statement, uh, and I didn't make this up, so please don't hold it against me. But I think that um, uh, diversity is being asked to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. And I think you know if you look at if you look at most DNI um, initiatives, the real objective or the output is inclusiveness. How do you measure inclusiveness? Being able to measure diversity question. is re- being able to measure diversity is fairly straightforward. I mean, that's really an accounting exercise, if you will. Right? Inclusiveness is different. And um, what we start, the network starts to show you whether or not uh, an organization or whether individuals within the organization are being included as part of the core network. We look at things like centrality and uh, between us and centrality, uh, you know, some of the ONA terms, to understand whether people are remaining at the periphery, whether particular, a particular group are remaining at the periphery, or whether they're actually being included. Uh, in the conversations and in the work environment uh, that exists. Uh, we then, we're actually working also with um, partners of ours who, I mean, the, the, the genre of, of network analysis that we do is often called passive network analysis, meaning we're looking at, uh, looking at the digital trails or the trace, uh, trace elements of, what, you know, the, of the interactions. What we're finding is that um, you know, we work with partners who are also doing some survey-based um, uh, approaches to understand attitudes. To me, being able to understand the survey, being able to understand attitudes as well as um, understanding behaviors comes together to help better understand whether a particular particular group uh, is um, is you know whether a particular group let's just uh, let's say you know, from a gender perspective is included is being included or uh, not being included. So it gives you the ability to measure inclusiveness. That's that's fantastic. So so we have ripped through our time to. Um, um, Is there anything I should have asked you? No, I think, you know, look at the, I think that, you know, the question that you asked around privacy, I mean, I think that's a, you know, it was was an important one. And I think that, you know, I'm, uh, you know, the only thing is, I mean, you know, what the question I guess you would ask is how are our clients actually using it to make change? Are they, are they using it in any way to, to fundamentally shift ROI? Because I know a number of your listeners, if they're, if they're looking at applying ONX, where do they start? And, um, and how do they demonstrate ROI? And if I was to answer that question, I mean, I would, I would always say the, our approach to that is start, start slowly, start with a pilot, um, identify a business problem that's important to the business. So a, a problem that's important to the business um, where uh, networks can start to provide an, an, a, a unique, interesting, unbiased lens to solving that particular or at least informing that particular question that they have and then go from there. Got it. Got it. Okay, we should we should have another another one of these conversations just on that topic. Um, I would and love so, to. last thing is: is there anything that you want to be sure that takes away from our conversation today? Yeah. No. I mean, look. I think I think you know I, I've enjoyed the conversation, John. Um, I, the the one message I would give is: uh, so networks are you know networks are very important. We we recognize and fully understand that a lot of uh, you know, a lot of your listeners and those who are not familiar with networks can find this, uh, you know, potentially creepy. We've gone through, we've done a lot of thinking and a lot of, we've worked with a number of clients that we work with, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, you know, almost 100 clients across the world, uh, and many of them fairly large uh, clients as well, enterprise, uh, enterprise clients, global enterprise clients, to help them through the change management process, the communication process, uh, understanding how they navigate the InfoSec requirements, their own technology requirements, as well as the privacy um, obligations and the legal obligations. So it's, uh, if, if, you know, at the end of the day, the one message I would give is, it, I think as particularly as millennials come into the workforce, attitudes around, um, around uh, sharing information and sharing networks are changing. Um, this, I think Josh Burson um, talked about this in his, uh, in his sort of future of work element. Uh, this is kind of uh, a very important way of the future. So I'd love to work with any of your, um, any of your listeners who might be interested in this. Fantastic. So take a moment, reintroduce yourself, and tell people how to find more. 
Yeah, so uh, my name is Manish Goel. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of TrustSphere, uh, where you can find lots more information is at www, obviously, trustsphere.com, trustsphere with an S, S-P-H-E-R-E. Um, and if you want to contact me, it's manish.goel, G-O-E-L is my surname, at uh, trustsphere.com. Would love to hear from you, uh, whether you like this or whether you, or any comments that you may have. Thanks very much, Manish. I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation this morning. And thanks, everybody, for listening in. Um, Thank you. You've been listening to HR Examiner's Executive Conversations, and we've been talking with Manish Goal, who is the CEO and co-founder of TrustSphere, um, a network analysis company that um, is shaking things up. Thanks for tuning in. And Manish, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye now. Thanks, John.